Hello everyone, welcome to the podcast. I'm Darren and I'm a millennial. And I'm Dennis and I'm a baby boomer. And you're, and you're listening, listening to, to M3, M3 Minutes. Minutes. <laughs> the show where we talk about M3 and what's going on in the hospitality industry. Today we have two special guests with us. We have Jen Hur and Marty Ketchum from Terrapin Investments and Management Corporation. And they're checking into the podcast to talk about the generational differences in the industry. How are you both doing today? Great, thanks. Fabulous. We're so excited to have you both on the show. Uh, Jen Hur is the Director of Finance. And Marty Ketchum is the CFO. So could one of you just give us a brief introduction about Terrapin? Sure. We're a, we are a hotel um, investment and management company. We have uh, 14 hotels right now that we own and manage from coast to coast. And is that primarily in the U.S.? Yes, the all in the U.S. Okay. Well, great. We're going to talk a little bit about generational differences in the hotel industry, but first let me ask both of you, uh, Marty and Jen, uh, what is, how many years have you been in the hospitality industry? I've been in industry for five years. I worked for M3 for three, and then I've been with Terrapin for almost two. I've been in the industry for 35 years. I've been uh, with Terrapin about seven and a half years now. Well, that's awesome. So Jen, I'm gonna go ahead and start with you. What I'd like to do is let's talk about the different recruiting strategies that exist between Gen Xers versus a millennial. Well, quite honestly, I don't really notice a big difference because everything is really online. You know, you go to your different portals, whether it be Indeed or Monster or whatnot. Um, and that's really how you, you, you post your job outs out there nowadays. Now, I will say our owner sometimes wants me to go put a post in the paper. And I'm like, um, no, Tony, sorry, not going to happen. <laughs> no one looks at the paper anymore. So uh, I think just more of the methodology has changed versus how. And do you think that's more just specific to the Internet and everything being online? Yes. Got it. So are there any forms of recruiting that are just obsolete at this point? Well, the paper. The putting paper. an ad in the paper for sure. Yeah. Yes. Is that the only one or are there <laughs> others? <laughs> um... That's really the only one I can really think of. I mean, everything's so online now, and you can just go on and apply, whether it be, you know, you're looking for a 20-year-old or a seasoned veteran. Mm -hmm. So that's really the same. All right. Well, Marty, do you have any? Yes, I think that a big difference I see um, over the last couple of years since we've been interviewing a lot is the younger generation, they – they want to know right away what their benefits are, you know, what their work hours are, what what they're going to get, not not more so of what the job's about. And then the older people, I think, still are more <clears throat> looking for stable, you know, and they still want to know what, you know, the bells and whistles are, but they're more asking questions about the job, if it will be a good fit for them and things like that. So I think that's the biggest difference that I've seen. Awesome. Marty. Have you seen the hotel industry change over the years? Any big differences, in your opinion? Yeah, I think it's gotten a little more exciting, having the younger generation. <laughs> it used to be pretty pretty boring. Um, I think sometimes sitting in offices, especially in accounting, I think it's gotten a little bit, just a little bit more fun. Yeah, can you give some examples of what makes it more fun? I think the younger generation. I mean, because when I started, I was the young one in the office, and everyone I was working for, were the baby boomers, the older generation, um, some almost retiring. And, you know, there was, you just went in, you worked, that was it. You didn't chit-chat, you didn't laugh. Um, you kind of hung out with them some, but it was more so for dinner or going to somebody's house. It wasn't real, like, friendly-friendly. It was more family type that you cared about them. But now, um, like in our office, <clears throat> we have a, you know, open concept so we can, we can talk, we can laugh, and you gotta make it fun. Now, just keying off of that word on fun, you know, what do you guys do? Do you have, you know, Nerf Wars in the office, or? Not yet, but Not yet. that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any examples of what type of fun activities your group does? Uh, not quite yet because we just got the office up and going, but you know, the open concept really helps a lot. And that's what we had in our Aspen office, you know, we had bikes, bikes in there, skis in there, um, you know, people nice. would pop out and go skiing and, um, you know, dog friendly, things like that. And you can just, just having the open concept was re really, I think has brought, brought a lot, you know, a lot of laughter and joking and, and even just camaraderie. It's either easier to have a conversation and talk through something if you're like 
sitting next to somebody instead of sitting in a cubby or it locked in an office. Well, congratulations on your new location. Thanks. So how does growing up in the in technology affect how millennials interact with the industry? Um, growing up in technology has made it very easy to learn new topics and just be open to change because there's so much change that's been going on in the past 30 years in really any industry whatsoever. Um, but like you, you look at my parents who have really struggled, like my dad to this day still uses a flip phone. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's getting hard to find and he's actually going to convert here and I think shortly to a smartphone, but yes, he still uses a flip phone. So does my dad. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I actually heard flip phones were coming back. Oh yeah. Because we want to be able to fold it into something small. I can see the smaller size, but, <laughs> um, but just being able to really, you know, get in there and explore and you know we don't necessarily need a manual with step-by-step -step instructions growing up in that day and age you really just okay what does this button do what does this button do and you kind of get in there and just just get in there and play and figure out what it does it has helped a lot marty why do you think understanding millennials is important and let me just give you a, a brief example of i think why we need to understand millennials i had an associate at m3 come up to me the other day and asked me that when you were in elementary school, were the continents still attached to each other? <laughs> were they still together? <laughs> and uh, then I had another one ask me if uh, Alaska was a state when I was growing <laughs> up. So, uh, you know, given these differences that, the, you know, we obviously have, but, but, you know, why do you feel like understanding them is important? Well, because they're, they're such a big workforce right now, and they're, you know, they, we have to understand what they need and how they want to work, and we have to, I think, we need to kind of mold ourselves now, the older generation, to work with the younger ones because, um, you know, we're going to be all retired in a few years, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> so I think we just really need to understand them, um, you know, because and, 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 it is a totally different world out there now and the way they, you know, the way they want to work, the way they want to learn even is different than the way we used to learn and train and, and things. Do you think we're doing a good job trying to understand them? <laughs> I think if you want to, yes, but I do know that there's a lot of people out there still that just don't want to. They're set in their ways, and that was the way that they've worked for, you know, 50 years, and they don't, they don't want to change for this new generation, which I, you know, I, that's not, it's not going to work, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of my generation, they, their goal was to go to work for General Motors and stay there, you know, mm -hmm. 30, 40 years and then mm -hmm. retire, and if you had two jobs on your resume, you were a trader. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and now we're seeing that that's how millennials move up, uh, get promotions, mm -hmm. pay raises. So it's, uh, it's sort of a tough, tough thing to understand if you, you know, didn't grow up that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, and that's a shout out for all millennials. Hashtag millennials are the future. And I do have a question actually for you, Dennis. Uh, you were talking about you've had some associates come up and ask you questions. Now we all know that the continents were still together when you were first born, but yes, was but, yes, they were. But but was Alaska a state when you were born? Uh, yes, I think it had just uh, received statehood. Uh, just just received don't, statehood. Don't don't ask me about Hawaii. I'm not sure about Hawaii, but uh, I yeah. think I think Alaska was a state. <laughs> so, a uh, question for both of you: uh, Each of you can jump in on your own time. But how is communication different between Gen X and Millennials? Um. I haven't seen a big difference. I noticed with one of our younger employees, like she's more apt to send an email or she's very, very reluctant to pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. And that has definitely been some issues. And like, you're, you get a lot farther sometimes, you know, depending on the case, to, to actually pick up the phone and actually call somebody. But I'm um, sending multiple e emails all the time. Um, but I think that's kind of the extreme that I've seen from my perspective. I don't, I don't know about you, Marty. Uh, <clears throat> I agree. I mean, I think, and I think I see it more so than, than just with Jan. I mean, just with texting in general, you know, um, like you said yesterday, Darren, you know, you pick your phone up and you swipe and there you have your date. Back in the old days, you had to, you know, talk to somebody and pick the phone up and call <laughs> them and, you know, <clears throat> things like that. So I think the whole communication with the texting, I mean, kids sit there and text all night long instead of picking a phone up. And, you know, I was so against it for so long, but it's the way of the generation. And there's, you know, either get on board or 
you don't. And, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't change it. So, you know, I think that's the biggest is, is the way people communicate. And actually going back to Jen's point, it's actually not as an extreme example as you think. Uh, back when I was in college, I had somebody that actually paid me $5 each time to call Pizza Hut and order a pizza for him because he did not want to do it and online ordering and all that stuff really wasn't there yet. And I was like, I can do this all day, but you know. Maybe he wanted Domino's. That's why he didn't want to call Pizza Hut. Well, that's why he never tipped me. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I know I'm on the older side of the millennials like you are, mm -hmm. and um, I, I am more. 22. You are not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm much more apt to like pick up the phone. Like I have a lot of friends that you know they still want to text. I'm like I don't want to text you, um, and I, I find that more in, in definitely in the younger millennials. I, I know I'm probably a rare breed in, the, in that side. We hit on this just a little bit earlier about how millennials move up and you know get pay raises and that type of thing. But how, how do you see that? How do you see what is the millennials? Um, success ladder look like? How do they perceive that? You know, I think, I think they, they want and expect to climb higher and faster than our generation. I mean, it took me 30 years to get to where I'm at. And, you know, I know sometimes young people, they're in their job for two or three years and they want to be at the top. And they, they kind of, not all of them, but there's some people that really, they just expect it. They think they go to a job for two years and um, show up and do what they're asked and then think that they're going to go to the top and you know I think they still need to work um, you know as hard as everyone else but <laughs> they <clears throat> they just seem like they want to want to get there faster you know and I'm still in the old school mind where you learn everything you learn every single job and that's how you're going to climb your way up because you know if you're up here you need to know everything that's going on down below you and for me it wasn't so much about being on the top it was wanting to keep my mind moving and, and keep growing as a person where like you know I may have had a job and I felt like I not necessarily became stagnant but my learning mentality was I plateaued and so I wanted to get to the next stop and learn more so it wasn't more about being top dog it was I wanted to learn more and more and just kind of keep my mind going yeah uh, my generation you know since we had 40 years at general motors we had time to move up the ladder we were not in such a hurry i think mm -hmm. uh, but maybe since uh, the millennials are not staying in job positions as long or with companies as long maybe they feel like there's more of a rush mm -hmm. maybe to achieve i don't know yeah i mean part of that definitely comes from both the way that universities come up through school you know we're told our whole lives, hey, you graduate, you're going to be making 80K right out of college, no experience necessary. And then when they start applying, it's like, hey, entry-level position needs five years of experience, mm -hmm. right? You make 80K? Yeah, right. Yeah, when you first came out of school, you made 80K? Oh, no, I made um, minimum no. wage. Yeah. Okay. Like, I, I made $12 an hour, I think. <laughs> minimum wage was uh, 50 cents when I got out of school. Yeah, and I think it was like $7 an hour, and it took me about four years to even hit like 10, 12 bucks an hour. Yeah. So it, you remember you I remember used to, if you made your age, you were you had arrived. If you made the same salary as your age, oh, if you wow. were 40 years old, if you made $40,000, you had arrived and everything was good. Oh, I thought you meant hourly. I'm sitting here trying to do the calculations <laughs> in my head like, whoa, wait a minute. I got some work to do to catch up to that. <laughs> Uh, so we actually just kind of talked on this a moment ago. You're talking about there's an open workspace now, so um, it's allowing people to connect more. You know, can you kind of explain how the transition of the offices from your experience have occurred? What did it used to be? What is it? What it is? What is it? Uh, but you know, how did they used to be, and is one better than the other? I think it's better now being open. Like um, even before I moved to Terrap and the company I was with, we still had the old school offices, and you know, I sat in my little office all day long, all by myself, you know, had some phone calls, had a little interaction, but um, it just, it, it's a little boring, and it is a little stagnant doing that, you know, um, and then when we moved in with Terrapin, you know, first time our boss said, oh, we're going to have this big open room, and I'm like, what, are you kidding me, and then we get in there, it's like, oh, this is great, so then when we opened our Houston office, I was the same way, we, you know, we were looking at the build out, and like, I want a big open office for everybody, you know, and then we have two closed offices, but they're windows and 
um, doors are open and, and things like that. So I just, I, I really think it has helped a lot, I think, with communication. Because you can hear if somebody's struggling with something, so you can just jump up and, you know, go help them, or they can ask openly instead of, you know, feeling bad about coming in your office. Now, when you say hear them struggling, are they, like, writhing in pain yelling? Or <laughs> no. how exactly does your team? If they're trying to work on something and they can't get the concept, you're, you know, if you hear them, I don't know, yeah, wincing with pain because they can't do a bank wreck or something, I don't know. <laughs> in, in earlier years, uh, you know, if you, were, if you were struggling with something, the only time that that would come out would be a departmental meeting, whereas now with the open space concept mm -hmm. and collaboration, you can actually see somebody struggling by, you know, I would say some of the, uh, you know, rubbing the forehead, right. you know, that type of thing. So, but yeah, years ago when everybody had an office or everybody was in queues, you wouldn't see, mm -hmm. see those hints that, you know, you're struggling. Only in a meeting when everybody got mm -hmm. together. And I think younger employees, um, you know, would feel bad coming into your office to even ask you for help, you know, again, because unless they want to text you, I need help. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, plus it makes you a lot more aware of being in an open office uh, space because if you're walking along and you're deep in thought, you might have a frown or you are scratching your head, you know, people are going to be like, you okay? You seem kind of mad or, oh, we need to stay away from that guy. Mm -hmm. Like, he obviously has an aura around him that we need to avoid <laughs> for a little bit. Yeah, we've been in that concept over a year now at M3, and I'm seeing a big difference. Even a baby boomer can see the difference in the uh, exchange of ideas, mm -hmm. collaboration, uh, just the, uh, just getting along with your coworkers. Mm -hmm. I just think it's really been a big help. Yeah, and to your point, uh, you know, that concept is something that people hesitate towards, mm -hmm. especially uh, developers, because they like to be heads down, you know, uh, headphones on, really focused. Mm -hmm. And when you realize that you can still be heads down focused, even on an open floor plan, when everybody starts buying into it, it's fantastic, because mm -hmm. you really do seem teamwork. It's, it's louder. It is more exciting, because they're not just texting. They're literally talking across the aisles to each mm -hmm. other, and it's wide open. And, but there are, there are some downsides to that. When uh, the baby boomers are taking their 3 o'clock nap, uh, it's <laughs> obvious that they are taking a nap, whereas used to we'd be in an office and we could close the door. You know, now I could have sworn that M3 came out with this new amazing room that they told us about called the relaxing room. It's something oh, yeah, that, it's a, that it's a very new thing when what? we can actually schedule peacetime. What goes on in there? <laughs> I actually, well, well, I don't know. I've never done it, to be honest. But it is, it is, it is very peaceful and zen looking. But outside of that, I've been afraid to step through, the, step through the threshold. As a baby boomer, I, I don't know if I know what zen looking means. But uh, you can it's, explain that to me later. Well, imagine just changing the G of Gen X and put the X in front. You okay, got zen. thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's straight clear forward. to me now. <laughs> Uh, now that we've talked about some of the differences, what, what are some of the uh, items that millennials and the baby boomers or the Gen Xers have in common? What, uh, what's your opinion on that? As Marty points to Jen for the answer. Marty's being supportive. That's what they I, I don't know. Delegating. I mean, everyone's yeah. so obvious to point out all of our differences. Um, but when it comes down to what's in common, I mean, and I think just, I think the baby boomers and the Gen Xers are gravitating towards the millennial culture, which I did not think was going to happen at mm -hmm. first. I thought we will never put up with any of that stuff. <laughs> you know, and uh, but I see, I mean, even myself, I mean, I love kidding around with those those young people, and they love kidding me about the continents mm -hmm. be together and mm -hmm. the statehood and all that, but uh, I just see, you know, I I'm now love the open concept, so there are a lot of things that, you know, millennials represent that I see myself as 62 years old, changing my ideas that I never thought would happen. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it is because, like I said earlier, it's just, it's, it's fun. I mean, you guys, your generation, for the most part, are really happy, you know. Um, it, it just seems like you're not stressed out like older people were, like when we were, you know, working at 35. It just seemed things were so stressful. But um, I, I just think that you guys have, even if you are stressed out and in a crunch, you still can, you know, laugh through it and work through it. And that's kind of how I am. I think that's why I kind of get along, you know, okay with with you guys' generation now too. Um, but I think, I think Dennis is right, is that, you know, it's, I think that us gravitating towards you guys really is, 
mm-hmm. bringing the, maybe the two together and maybe the, the big gap that people were saying and complaining about the millennials so much is maybe starting to close now. I believe it is. Now, we were so stressed because, you know, you had World War I going on. I mean, well, we were I really stressed. <laughs> Talking for myself, you know, I had World War One, and then you thought that was over, and then you had a second one. So, uh, but anyway, yes, I see your point. Yeah, we, and then we concentrate a lot on when people was born, but I think it also boils down to a person's personality. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, yes. like yeah. you could be born in this generation, but you have the opposite personality. Like, Nick like Marty, you are so flexible. Like, you know, you fit more the millennial personality, and then I know people that are younger than me that fit more like right. mm-hmm. the you know, baby boomer personality. So it, it goes both ways. Like just because you're born in a certain generation doesn't mean that you're stuck in that. Yeah, I know some baby boomers that would be insulted if they had been asked, what does a brontosaurus burger taste like? Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway. Fred Flintstone, eh? That was, <laughs> that was great. So it all comes down to this question, ladies. Are millennials really that different than the previous generation? I think at first we've, thought they were, but I think the more you're around them, especially in the work environment, and I have kids that are millennials, a lot of kids <laughs> are millennials, um, I think it's the, the gap is closing, and I'm, uh, I think there's still a big difference in, you know, you guys want to go, most of them, most of you guys from point A to point B, like really quickly, mm-hmm. because of what you are, lear- you know, taught in school, and I even see that with my teenagers, it's like, well, I don't want to go through that, I just want to be right here. Um, I think that's the part that's always going to probably be there. But I think besides that, I don't, you know, I think that's the, the biggest difference that I see. Um, Marty, you just made me realize I helped raise three millennials. So is it something <laughs> I contributed that gave them that mindset? There we maybe, go. Maybe that's maybe the million dollar question. <laughs> there wow. you go. I know. Wow. Well, how did they turn out? They turned out wonderful. According to? Me. Okay. <laughs> 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 so, uh, Jen, do you have any last words you'd like to throw in on this conversation? No, I mean, I don't I think we're really that different. Um, like I said, I mean, it really boils down to a person's personality and not necessarily what year they were born. Um, yeah. I well, concur. <laughs> yeah, so I, I absolutely uh, appreciate both of you taking time out of your busy day. So now what we're going to go ahead and do is read you some memes and tweets that have been sent out, and we want to see what your reactions are like. So feel free to laugh, but just tell us what you think when I read it, but we're just going to go ahead and split them up. What's a meme? A meme? <laughs> well, That's a baby uh, boomer question. Well, well uh, a, me- meaning. a meme is a grandma. Yes. But when you take out the syllable, it's a picture with some sort of phrase that it's supposed to be funny, or it has some sort of truth that makes it funny because it's like, I can totally relate to that. Hashtag okay. legit. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I got you. <laughs> so the first one is, I love baby boomers who say, kids don't even know how to write in cursive in a negative way. Like, okay, grandma, you can't even turn your laptop on without getting six viruses and wiring half your retirement money to a Nigerian prince. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know about most signatures that I see nowadays, but you can't even read it. It's a bunch of scribble. Mm-hmm. Like a good doctor's signature, for example. So it's cursive. Who A, who writes in cursive anymore? Mm-hmm. And B, you can't read it to begin with. So... Yeah. No, I agree. It's funny. I remember having to sit there and write those little cursive, you know, mm-hmm. books dotted lines and I still wrote so bad you couldn't see it. I mean, <laughs> I thought cursive was a waste of time. Look at Tony's signature, it's just some lines on paper and that's it. I, was like, oh. I almost said, if they don't know cursive, how do they sign checks? But they don't write checks. They don't write checks. There, there are no checks. I yeah. have okay. not owned a checkbook in years. Wow. Well, years. Well, good for you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that's even true with buying houses now. You don't really sign anything. It's all digital. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, I don't even think in some schools they're teaching cursive anymore, I believe, you know, so... At some point, it's almost like a dying handwritten language. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Latin. I mean, it's a good school to have, but. <laughs> and I think I think the the young kids need to teach their grandmas how to turn the laptop on without getting viruses. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the problem is that they just sometimes forget that they actually have a Nigerian prince because they may have been from that area. And like, oh my God, I totally forgot about Chuck. Or it could be like. Send them all or it could be like my aunt who has a cell phone but won't turn on because she thought of turning it on is going to use her minutes. 
<laughs> but we can't call her because it's not on, therefore she can't <laughs> use her. <laughs> <laughs> So you got to send an email and hey, turn on your phone. Oh, she doesn't even have phone. email. Oh. So, like, I don't even know why she has a cell phone because it doesn't get turned on and no technology. So then you have to send a letter and right. know that it takes two days to get there. Right. And that the mailman shows up at 2 o'clock and then call at 2 o'clock. Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the second one is if I had a dollar for every Gen Xer that complained about my generation, I'd have enough money to buy a house in the market they ruined. <laughs> We got a really um, good response out of the Gen Xers for that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Sometimes not. Did we really ruin the market? No. You did did they ruin the market? We're stuck in the market. Yeah, who, who ruined the market? Oh, we ruined the market at saying, oh, yeah. yeah, no, I don't think so. No. I don't think so. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, I'm going to use my best millennial voice for this next one. Uh, baby boomers be making 170 k a year and don't know how to rotate PDFs. <laughs> well, this is true, Dennis. You <laughs> don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I have to admit, sometimes it's like, Jen, how do I do this? What do I... I can't download it. It doesn't happen often, but now and then there's just some little thing. It's like, Jen, help me. <laughs> now, the real question is, is how many hours did you spend on it before calling her in and it takes five well, seconds to be, oh, you just click that button? Yeah, now I don't spend a whole lot of time. If I can't figure it out, I call her right away. Oh, that's good. But that's it doesn't fun. happen very often. I do know how to open up a PDF, though, and rotate a PDF. <laughs> was, just, just in case anybody listening was curious. Yeah. I Marty Cashman knows how to rotate PDFs. <laughs> I was driving to the app store the other day. I never could find it. So, uh, I don't know what's going on with that? But uh, anyway, so, so you know, these three examples. What makes them funny? Is it because they're true? You know, what what really generates the laughter it, when we read these? I don't think it's it's kind of true in a way. I think it's a little exaggerating, but you know, it's true. Like, you know, I know an older person, and she thinks when she gets a notification on from Facebook that somebody sent her that Facebook thing, not that it's just a notification <laughs> popping up on hers. Um, so I think it is kind of true in a way, but you know. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> not for everyone, but there are definitely those people where it is like, you know, take my aunt for back to the example where you know, she can't use her quote unquote minutes because <laughs> it's not turned on. <laughs> so, in conclusion, how can we create a place where generational differences can work together? I mean, there's strengths on both sides. Somehow there's got to be a way to put those together to get maximum performance. Yeah, I agree. And I think that the, the more you're, the longer it goes and, and the more you work with you know, different generations, I think you really see that there can be a good median there, you know, because we both have our strengths. I mean, these guys have great strengths and us oldies have great strengths. And I think, you know, if they learn from us and we learn from them, that's where the real, you know, good, good middle happens. And I mm -hmm. think that's kind of where hopefully the world's going, you know, now that the big split is getting smaller. <laughs> <laughs> Dead gummit, we do have both have strengths. We do. We do. Yes. <laughs> Millennials don't get it. <laughs> now there was a big group hug after that wonderful speech, so we appreciate it, Marty. Jen, any last word for you? Um I think we've we're already there. I, I don't really know that there's a big difference between the two generations. I think we're working together just fine and and you know we're already there. It's it's just about coming to peace. I mean, we make this big difference about how different we are. We're really not. So. Well, awesome. Agreed. Yes, I concur. Uh, I concur with Jen Hurd. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> I third that statement. <laughs> so Jen and Marty, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to meet with us today. You both have a great rest of your day. Sure. Thanks a lot, guys. It was fun. You as well. Thank you all for coming back and joining us for our second season. Be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, and our SoundCloud. We release new episodes at the end of every month, so be sure to come back and listen for more. You can also follow us on our social media platforms. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and our handle is M3Accounting. That's M as in Mary, the number three, and then the word accounting. 
As always, here's to your success. And thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next month.